for the latest in strategic affairs subscribe to our youtube channel click the bell icon for updates hello and welcome to our continuing series on the russia ukraine war i am surya gangadharan This evening, we are looking at the economic impact of the war, whether in terms of the rise in fuel and fertilizer prices, uh, the shortage of food that we are seeing in many parts of the world, and the general uncertainties going forward. My guest is Mr. P. S. Raghavan, former ambassador to Russia. Uh, he is also chairman of the National Security Advisory Board. Uh, sir, welcome. Glad to have you again. Thank you very much. Good to be with you again. Uh, so before I come to the economic issues and all that, I'd like to uh, get a word from you, a reaction from you on President Putin's address yesterday, uh, where he talked about, uh, you know, um, where he blamed the U.S., the, blamed the West basically for the Ukraine war and um, suspended the New START treaty, uh, the only uh, arms control agreement between the two sides. Uh, is this a new low? Um, how do you see this? Well. I don't think you would have expected to hear anything different from President Putin uh, saying that the war is really the fault of the West. Uh, in the ultimate analysis, of course, he was the one who made the decision to uh, invade Ukraine. Having said that, however, you know, there is this larger picture and that larger picture is a strategic contestation that is between Russia and the West in its uh, entirety. So Ukraine is the immediate excuse, but then obviously the US and NATO countries are all involved in this. So this is a strategic contestation. Uh, the US has its own objectives. Each of the NATO countries has its own uh, perspectives on this, depending on their geography, depending on their historical uh, experiences with Russia. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you say this is a new low, actually it can't get lower than this. Uh, it has been pretty low for a pretty pretty long time. Uh, there have been, even before this war started, there has been a, a very tense standoff between Russia and uh, the West in general and Ukraine in particular. Sanctions have been existing even uh, from before then. Though Now, of course, they've, been, they've multiplied uh, extraordinarily. Yeah. The start itself... Uh, actually, what President Putin has said is more symbolic than real in the sense that he has said that he will, Russia will suspend uh, participating in it, but he has also said that they will not create any new capacities unless the US creates new capacities and they will not permit the US to inspect uh, Russian compliance with the <clears throat> treaty, which is <laughs> what you might expect. I mean, at the time of war, you're not going to let uh, mm -hmm. what you consider as your adversary uh, inspecting your facilities. So, so all of that is actually uh, what you might expect. It is, it is a defiant statement. It's a statement that says that Russia will not back off in the face of uh, uh, well, both uh, battlefield reverses as well as a NATO uh, arms build up in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So now let's get to the economic impact of this war. So one of the points um, uh, of the whole sanctions regime was to ensure the economic collapse of Russia. Now, that hasn't happened. Uh, does that surprise you? I mean, um, how do you see this? Well, you know, I don't think it should surprise anybody, really, because sanctions have never been designed to, uh, to cause immediate capitulation. Uh, they're they're uh, basically... Uh, a fuse with a long, uh, uh, it's a long standing fuse. I mean, uh, the point is this time some uh, what they call the nuclear options were tried in the mm. sense that uh, the, the uh, freezing of Russia's foreign exchange reserves, the cutting off of Russian banks from uh, uh, the yes. SWIFT messaging system. Now, mm. all of this was considered to be a, a shock treatment that might uh, really impact the Russian economy. But on the other hand, the same uh, uh, countries that wanted to impose these sanctions needed Russian energy. And it was very difficult to wean themselves away from Russian energy. So, in fact, in the immediate period after the uh, sanctions were imposed, their oil imports from Russia increased. 
the oil prices increased. So Russia was actually raking in more money than it was before the crisis. Uh, and also, you know, while they cut off major Russian banks from SWIFT, there was a very large number of Russian banks which were not cut off from SWIFT. There were countries which were not implementing the sanctions. They were not party to the sanctions. So there was a lot of trade that Russia was doing, particularly in energy, but also in other uh, uh, products. So actually, Russia's current account surplus uh, increased in the period immediately after the war. The ruble also, as famously people uh, keep talking about, strengthened. In fact, strengthened to the extent that it caused worry to the Russian central bank that it was getting too strong. So uh, there is no doubt, of course, that the export controls and the technology denials will eventually have an impact on on Russian uh, on the Russian economy. But it hasn't happened now. The IMF has also pointed out that the Russian economy fell much less than what was expected before. And in fact, in this year, they expect the Russian economy to record a small growth even. The same thing on the other side, you know, the, the economic uh, sanctions were also expected to hit the uh, Europeans very hard because of the energy, sudden rise in energy prices, sudden energy shortages. That also has not happened as expected. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe has managed to uh, stabilize its uh, energy supplies, albeit at a higher price level. But uh, it has got along pretty well and it, it, it did not uh, fall into recession. Uh, it's still, uh, it, I think the IMF said that its growth bottomed out at 0.7% and is expected to rise in pretty yeah. pretty. So eventually the kind of impact that the economic sanctions were expected to have, whether it is on Russia, whether it is on Europe, didn't quite materialize the same way. And, and therefore, the hope that, or the, the expectation of the wishful thinking, if you like, of, of some, that the economic factors will push the two sides towards an early settlement did not happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that um, uh, not all Russian banks were hit by sanctions. Is that deliberate? I mean, uh, is it intended to leave a window open for Russia in the hope that one day, you know, maybe they'll see reason and is that how it is? Uh, yes, it was deliberate, but it was not to keep a window open for Russia, but a window open for the West. Because given the dependence on Russian natural resources, it was not, it's not only oil and gas. It's also aluminium. It's also a whole lot of other natural resources. You know, eventually Russia holds something like 30 to 40 percent of the world's natural resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you cannot live without it entirely, without damaging your own economy. Therefore, if you see even the pattern of sanctions, uh, they have been very careful in the manner in which in the in the industries that they have covered by the sanctions, in the sectors that they have covered by the sanctions. And, and, they, and even in the oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs that they have covered in the sanctions, mm -hmm. some of them who actually held large stakes in publicly listed companies which dealt with commodities important to the West, they remained outside the purview of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of the, the sanctions, were they, they were designed or they were intended to hurt Russia most but to minimize the damage to the sanctions imposing countries and their economies. It's very difficult to do that in this world of interlinkages. Yeah. It's very difficult to fine tune and calibrate that, which is why it has not worked the way it was intended. So Russian banks, other than the major banks, still continue to trade. And since countries like even the UAE and uh, uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, including India, of course, also have not imposed the sanctions, there are these various avenues for trade with Russia, which continue to uh, work. Mm -hmm. And this is deliberate. Yes, it, it is. It is deliberate. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it was intended to hurt Russia as much as possible without hurting the West. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get that right balance there. Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, what do you think Russia has achieved so far in this war? That's a very difficult question. You know, if you look at it uh, in terms of military achievement, I think you have to say that it was a military miscalculation. Mm. Uh, the way in which they handled their tactics, the way in which they handled their equipment, the way in which they handled their personnel, especially in the first half of the war. 
I think did not do the Russian uh, uh, armed forces any uh, <laughs> any favors or <laughs> did not get them any credit. Uh, politically, also, I would say, in my opinion, that there, there, there was a misjudgment. Uh, uh, I think the expectation was that uh, the war would end early because the Ukrainians would not put up any resistance, that the Ukrainians may, in fact, even uh, 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 welcome the Russians uh, with open arms. And there was certainly the expectation that they, I mean, I, I would say that it was not expected that Europe would put up such a strongly united front against Russia. There are uh, European countries do have different perspectives based on their own geopolitical uh, uh, ideas. They all have different uh, history with Russia. Uh, they have different economic linkages with Russia. So the fact that they have managed to sink all these differences and to put up such a united front would certainly have been a surprise to Russia. And I think the, the uh, not being able to anticipate that would be put down to political misjudgment. But eventually, look, where are we today in the war? You still have the two countries facing off against each other. Yeah. The, the long-term impact of this war, the long-term strategic, you know, this is a strategic contestation. And, and eventually, what matters is in the long term, what is the outcome of the war and how does it reshape the strategic equations between Russia and the rest of the world, Russia and the West to start with. So, on that front, I would say the jury is still out. It's still an open question where we will go. We have no idea how the war will eventually turn out. And that is what will eventually in the long term uh, decide on uh, whether or not Russia was foolish. And if it was, how foolish it was in, in uh, embarking on this uh, uh, invasion. I mean, the war does suggest a lot of uh, level of um, dysfunctionality in the Russian system. That is difficult to say, uh, because what you have is actually information which is in the public domain and information in the public domain is very often not of yeah. Russian. Yeah. Uh, now, dysfunctionality, you can measure dysfunctionality in many ways. Uh, as I said, the military uh, uh, campaign, especially in the first half of the first six to eight months of the or nine months of the year, maybe even, uh, did appear from the outside to be shambolic in execution. Mm -hmm. uh, but in other areas, as I said, Russian economy seems to have managed reasonably well. The sanctions proofing that the Russians tried to do over the last many years, because they were always anticipating sanctions, stood up well, tolerably well, considering that they could not have expected their foreign exchange reserves to have been frozen. They could not have expected the the uh, banks uh, swift uh, cut off so dysfunctionality in some areas yes but uh, beyond that it is difficult to say because people uh, i was seeing on cnn yesterday uh, cnn also say seem to say that uh, president putin's uh, uh, approval ratings is very high at the moment uh, that uh, the economy is doing not too badly so you know there are elements of functionality amidst the dysfunctionality in that uh, system. Now, you briefly uh, alluded to the impact on Europe. Uh, could you give us some more insight into how this is going? Because um, uh, Europe is uh, trying to move away from dependence on Russian energy. Uh, but long term, is this a feasible kind of an option? No, Europe really has very decisively over these last many months moved away from uh, Russian energy. Uh, in, in some ways, they have been forced to move away. You uh, recall very recently the uh, revelations about the sabotage of the Nord Stream yes. gas pipelines. The Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline in particular is one that has been supplying Germany with gas over many decades. Nord Stream 2 was, uh, was a major investment which had been completed and which would which had to be switched on, but had, was awaiting uh, validation, certification, and approvals. But that has also been uh, blown up. So, uh, in effect, that gas lifeline that Germany had with uh, Russia has been uh, broken. Similarly, the gas uh, uh, pipes through Ukraine, which are also coming into Europe, very unlikely that they will be uh, reactivated. So, 
in that sense, you know, the, the on land gas supplies from Russia to Europe, I think it is very difficult to see them pick up again. Uh, the American LNG uh, exports have largely taken their place. Uh, oil, of course, is something that you can stop buying oil today and you can start buying oil tomorrow. So uh, there is no finality or uh, permanence about it. Uh, but in general, it's fair to say what has happened over these last few months is that the directions of energy supplies have changed. And you are now looking at Europe looking east and west and the north-south supplies of uh, energy have shifted eastwards towards Asia. So mm -hmm. we have ended up buying a lot of Russian oil uh, and uh, reduced our uh, purchases from, the, from West Asia. Europe has increased its purchases from West Asia as a result of which West Asian oil has become more expensive as well. So you might see not necessarily a cutoff of Russian sub, uh, production uh, exports of oil because that's not possible. Russia is a huge uh, repository of both oil and gas. But you might see a different uh, combination of, of buyers and sellers of oil and gas uh, over a period of time, a change in the vectors of uh, energy supply, if you like. Mm -hmm. Do you also see a kind of a two-track Europe, the um, countries bordering Ukraine, being far more hardline, belligerent about Russia, perhaps those a little distance from the battlefield, Germany, France, for instance, uh, perhaps inclined to a, for a softer options? Well, you see, as of today, as I mentioned before, Europe has shown unprecedented unity. Yeah. It's a kind of unity that, that has actually masks the differences that you mentioned. They, they do, I mean, countries do have different perspectives because it's based on where they're looking at the world from, uh, in terms of Russia, where they're looking at Russia from, uh, their geographical uh, location, their historical experiences with Russia. I mean, you know, the countries of the Baltic, uh, the Baltic countries, which have been a part of the Soviet Union, countries like Poland and uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, with, who have been part of the Warsaw Pact. They have historical experiences with Russia, which they will not forget. And therefore, mm -hmm. there is a certain level of hostility tinged with uh, anxiety about Russian behavior, which obviously exists. Countries like France and Germany have had different experiences with Russia. And they've, in fact, uh, had, uh, I think, very uh, beneficial uh, trade and investment links with Russia. So obviously, they look at Russia differently. Uh, to a certain extent, this is reflected in the in the rea public reactions that you hear now when yes. nato announced its uh, new arms package with to uh, russia uh, some of the baltic countries and poland certainly asked for much more they said you should be sending uh, fighter jets you should be sending drones you should be sending long range artillery basically you should be sending everything that ensures not simply that ukraine does not lose but to ensure that russia uh, russia loses uh, uh, defeat is uh, handed out to Russia. So you have a group of people who are asking for much more. There are others who are not really quite as vocal. In fact, uh, President Macron made a couple of statements, one in December, I think, and one in the Munich yes. Security Conference quite recently, yes. where he said that, you know, eventually at some stage, a settlement should take into account Russia's security concerns or words to that effect. And, and he faced a lot of flack. He... Uh, there was a lot of criticism that uh, was trained at him from within the European countries. So there is a difference of outlook. But having said all that, the European countries have banded together under NATO in a very united way. And yeah. eventually the, the, they will go forward in a manner in which NATO collectively uh, decides. And there, of course, US is the decisive. Clearly, US is the leader of NATO. And, and it is US that has managed to cobble together very this very strong coalition where they, it has been able to get together these countries taking enormous economic sacrifices as well some yeah, of them yeah but they've, they've, they've uh, hung together they've, they've uh, stood together and we'll see how how it goes how forward it uh, how it goes forward and which stream of opinion sort of gets the upper hand uh, in the in the struggle ahead
I mean, what is your sense of all this equipment that the Ukraine is getting, you know, from Leopard tanks and Abrams tanks to uh, new generation uh, military equipment? I mean, is it really going to make such a difference on the battlefield? Uh, you know, these are all very uh, advanced and sophisticated weapons. But also, we must uh, recognize that there has been a lag between uh, promise and delivery. True. Simply because, you know, these, these equipment are not there lying ready to dispatch. They're all in uh, <laughs> armies of various countries and they were not yeah. really expected to be deployed. So that is one thing. Second thing is that uh, a mix of so many kinds of equipment requires training, requires the ability to integrate. And once yeah. again, I heard some uh, armed forces, uh, some former NATO uh, generals on, on, on TV saying the integration is proving to be quite a challenge. You know, mm -hmm. when you mix and match the uh, equipment and technologies of uh, 20 countries, putting them together into one integrated fighting unit yeah. it takes time. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes training. And that, I think, may uh, impact also on the way they are deployed. But having said all that, you know, we, we really are uh, don't have access to the kind of information we need to make any judgment yeah. of mm -hmm. the manner in which they uh, function. Mm -hmm. So, what? How do you rate? Uh, how do you see the way India has navigated this entire crisis? What's your sense of uh, what we have uh, achieved and where we are going? Yeah, I, I, as, as I said, and I've said this before, that you have to view the world from your geography and in terms of your interests. Uh, I said that European countries, for example, have all have different views based on their geographical and historical experiences. Yeah. And our views based on our geographical and historical experiences. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, just rushing to condemn Russia, uh, we thought was not the way to deal with our issues. Uh, our external affairs minister has been very eloquent and has repeatedly talked about this. When people have said, why do you... Uh, why are you so dependent on Russian arms? He said very clearly, because you guys didn't give us arms at that time. You guys were busy arming Pakistan. So, so we are now in a situation where 70% of our armed forces, uh, armed forces equipment is from Russia. So what do you expect us to do? To throw it out into the Indian Ocean? You know, so, so essentially, there are linkages that we have because of, again, history, historical alignments, because of geography, because that whole Eurasian landmass up above us is, is in churn. You have China there, you have Iran and Afghanistan, now Turkey coming in there, and Russia is there. So you need to manage, we need to manage our security issues in our part of the world before we start trying to uh, uh, talk about the European security architecture, which is what is being at the moment <laughs> contested there. So, so we have taken a back seat in that sense and of not uh trying to jump in there to to participate in a manner that wouldn't have actually helped anyone at all anyway there's nothing that you can contribute to settlement there or to uh, worsen the situation there so we have looked after our interests we have and the other thing that we have done is very clearly communicated to all the stakeholders that no action of ours threatens the interests of any one of the stakeholders we have not yeah. taken any action that actually threatens either Ukraine's interests or Europe's interests or America's interests in this. In fact, I would say if you talk about this Russian oil about which so much is made, <clears throat> what are we doing? You know, our Rus the Russian oil that we are buying, yes, we are buying at a discount which helps our economy, which prevents our economy from facing surging energy prices. But then a lot of this oil crude is being refined and petroleum products are being sold into Europe which is the one that is imposing sanctions. So Europe solves its conscience by saying, I'm not buying oil from Russia, but buys petroleum products from India, which have been made from Russian oil. And that actually ensures also our buying Russian oil ensures that the oil prices don't go much higher because otherwise we would also be competing with the Middle East, with the, the Europeans to buy West Asian oil. Yeah. So in many ways, our actions not only are not hurting the interests of uh, Europeans, it is helping the interests of the Europeans. And it gives them, it gives them a free pass to criticize India for buying Russian oil. Yeah. That, that, that's <laughs> like the hypocrisy that our external affairs minister keeps talking about. Yeah. 
exactly. Yeah. But you know, the uh, difficulties we are having in paying Russia for uh, military hardware that they have delivered, uh, is that's, that's, an, that's, a big, that's becoming a major issue, isn't it? Uh, well, I don't think that is such a major issue. The paying payments are not such a major issue. Uh, mm -hmm. I suspect that right now defense supplies may also, the, the schedule may have been disrupted because Russia has its own needs for its uh, mm -hmm. uh, war in Ukraine. The payments that the two governments has actu have actually worked out an arrangement of payment in local currencies, mm -hmm. uh, which means basically a ruble-rupee uh, arrangement by which you can uh, conduct trade and eventually from, from time to time uh, settle the uh, outstandings in one or the other currency. That exists, uh, that exists and that actually should be applicable not only to defense but also to other trades that India does. And you know, this is where we have, we seem to have some mismatch between what our government is saying and what our banking and business circles are doing. Uh, you see, we are not party to sanctions and therefore there is no reason why we should not trade with Russia. After all, we are trading with Russia, we are buying defense supplies, we are buying oil. So there is no reason why our companies should not export to Russia because the market that the Europeans have vacated in Russia should be available to us. And this yeah. is non-defense sector. And in fact, our external affairs minister has been telling Russia that you know you should buy more from India because uh, our uh, trade balance is getting distorted. So this is an opportunity. Russian companies want to buy from India. We, our banking and business circles have to understand more clearly that there is no sanctions threat here. And therefore, they should get into this, use this rupee ruble arrangement and use this uh, huge balance that you've got uh, because of oil and defense purchases in order to enter the Russian market. And there is no sanctions, there are absolutely no sanctions implications whatsoever here. So it, it is something that has been decided and it just has to be operationalized. Governments can do just so much. The rest has yeah. to be taken up by the uh, businesses and the banks. So last question, um, would you hazard a guess as to what we're going to see roll out in Ukraine over the next couple of months? I think that's an impossibility. Uh, it's impossible to guess what will happen because, uh, you know, as, as right now, both sides or all sides, if you like, whether it's Russia, whether it's Ukraine, whether it is US, NATO countries, all of them have taken a very inflexible position from which mm -hmm. they will find it very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. withdraw without loss of face. What therefore you're looking at, I mean, if there is a decisive military victory or even one decisive military uh, campaign in one direction or the other that might push uh, the two sides towards some kind to the negotiation table in some way whether that will happen or not is very difficult to say today uh, yeah. we do not know the situation on the ground we do not know how exactly uh, the uh, uh, the balance will uh, fall there is a very long line. There's a line of about, I think, 1,000 kilometers is the front line separating Ukrainian troops from Russian troops. Yeah. So we do not know where, uh, at which point it can be punctured, in which direction it can be punctured, and, and what the uh, two sides are planning. And then the uh, supplies, the armed supplies that have been promised is very significant. We need to see how soon they can get there. We need to see how soon they can be integrated, how soon they can be deployed whether they make any difference on the ground. And then there are questions also about manpower. Uh, the, the, uh, the number of manpower, the training of the manpower on both sides. So this is, this is a total imponderable. Uh, it's a case for astrology rather than political <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on that note, uh, Basil Raghavan, uh, pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to uh, have this interaction. And for those of you who joined us on this conversation, uh, do follow our series. Uh, we'll have another round coming up on Friday. And uh, we'll be looking at, uh, again, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, a different aspect of it. Thank you very much. Uh, do follow us on social media. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel.
थैंक यू एंड गुड नाइट